M. Moore was born in New Zealand and studied civil and structural engineering in Auckland. He then moved to London to work with O'Varrick and Partners from 1980 to 83 on the famous Norman Foster Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. He then moved to Sydney in 1983, sorry, 1983 to study architecture, graduating with honours from the University of Technology in Sydney. Later on, he received a Master of Architecture degree from RMIT University Melbourne, graduating the same year I did, in October 2000. Ian Moore Architects was established in 1990. Although known as Engel and Moore between 1996 to 2005, it has again been Ian Moore Architects since that time. And I would describe it as a practice producing meticulously rigorous, unapologetically modernist, and seriously good work. Ian has taught at Sydney University, University of Technology Sydney, University of New South Wales, and the Sydney Institute of Technology. Ian has also been a speaker and guest lecturer throughout Australia, as well as New Zealand, Singapore, Japan, Malaysia, Germany, and the UK. The practice has won numerous national and international awards and has been exhibited in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Singapore, Bangkok, Tokyo, Dublin, Glasgow, London, Munich, Berlin, Vicenza, Barcelona, <laughs> Buenos Aires, and also included in the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2008 and 2012. So, ladies and gentlemen, hear more. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, thank you to Brickworks. Uh, thank you all for coming along tonight. It's uh, very nice to be back in Perth uh, once again. I was just saying to Penny on the way in, it's her first visit to Perth, but uh, I was trying to count how many times I've been here now. It's getting up there, and it's always nice to come back. Um, and thank you to Stephen and, and to Bob uh, for their contribution to tonight, and particularly Stephen's invitation. And uh, when he did invite me, he said, you know, it's the Brickworks talk. So one of the prerequisites is you talk about at least one brick building. And I'm going, whoa, you know, <laughs> this could be tough. Um, because from right at the beginning of my career, I always would tell people that really what I was interested in was enclosing the maximum amount of space with the least possible amount of material and that material should always have physical dimensions which were as large as you could possibly get. So a brick is the antithesis of that thinking. Um, but having said, and I also come from New Zealand, and until I arrived in Sydney in 1979 on the way to London, I had never seen a brick and tile house because everything I ever saw was timber and my father was a builder and built everything out of timber. So I had to basically discard everything I'd learnt from being on site with my father to actually start to work with these buildings which were made out of bricks. So I have used bricks right through the sort of 30 odd years I've been in practice and 25 years that I've been in my own practice. But typically, until relatively recently, they were rendered over, they were <laughs> under the floor, they were in the roof, they were everywhere but on show. Now that is changing. I like to think of this as a maturing <laughs> and uh, after many, many years. So um, you will actually see some bricks tonight, I promise. Uh, so if I start with uh, this first project, which is actually where I'm lucky enough to live. Um, it's a brick warehouse from 1895 in it's Sydney. Bricks. It's got bricks, <laughs> yeah. I'm, thinking, I'm looking, sitting there looking at it, and on the inside it's all black and white, and I can't see a single brick. And then I go, oh, there's some outside. <laughs> so. It was a grocery warehouse. It's actually a great little building because it's got two street frontages, um, one where the car drives in and the other one, uh, and there were loading docks at both ends because it used to have horse and carts that used to come up and take all the stuff and deliver it to the corner stores. So one of the loading docks is the front door and the other one is where we park the car. And it's only 150 square metres all up, so about 75 on each floor, um, but it has some nice characteristics. Um, one of which is that there's a half level drop between the side that the car's on and the side where the front door is. So there's a split level in the middle. So you get not quite a double height space for the living area, but it, it is a nice volume. And upstairs, it was simply a completely open space. 
um, which was great, but when you convert it to residential use, you've got this thing that you know is always the elephant in the room, which is the need for a bathroom. <laughs> and so we've had to take that completely open space and put a bathroom in the middle of it. So I've tried to do that in the most discreet way by making it a very large piece of furniture, um, which you'll hopefully understand when you see the photographs. Um, so the elevations, uh, lots of bricks on show there. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and what we did, and if I turn this way, this one's pretty easy because all we did was reinstate the original double height opening that used to have big timber doors, but we've put steel frame windows and a roller door in there, but that is basically how the building was. On the other side, it's actually this palimpsest of the changes that have occurred since 1895 with various different people doing different things to it. And so I just added another layer to that by taking what was the loading dock at the lower level and actually slicing it all the way up to the top and bricking up the two Victorian double hung windows with recycled bricks that I took out of where I chopped out the other bit. So, um, and the nice thing, if you look really carefully when you look at the photographs, you'll see that the bricklayers, when they were putting those bricks back in, didn't always put the outside face to the outside. <laughs> there's one yellow one and there's a couple of white ones mixed in there, so it's actually quite nice. So in the section it's all pretty straightforward. You can see um, you know, the step that I talked about, the open space up the top. Incredibly thick floor because of the big steel beams that were holding up the big heavy timber floor that they used to store all the stuff on on the upper level. There's a, um, a trap door above the garage which is still there, it's covered over but it's still there where they used to just open the trap door and drop the stuff onto the horse and cart below. So there's another aspect to this house which you've got to understand and that's that the brief from my wife was that it had to be a black and white house. Um, she has a collection of black and white photographs um, from going back about 30 years and she had never been able to display them so part of the brief was to make a gallery so that she could actually bring these out of storage for the first time. Um, and the other thing was a bath. She wanted a really big bath, she wanted a really great bathroom and she had to have it incredibly well lit and if I failed there I was in big trouble. <laughs> so that was basically the brief. Um, so that's the new steel uh, that we put in there. I should actually, sorry, I've been very remiss. I've gone past the most important part of the whole talk. Um, <laughs> what generated a lot of the thinking in this house was the dimensions. This is where the original toilet was from 1895. It hasn't moved a millimetre. And that was, um, so that's only 700 millimetres wide. And there was, so there's a 100 millimetre wall. And then council insisted that we have three metres for our garage. And then we had a staircase to fit in with a handrail and all the rest of it. So basically, what we had left to build that wall was 10 millimetres. <laughs> and it had to hold up part of upstairs. So, uh, what it ended, and there was only one thing, and from my structural days, I know that, you know, 10 millimetres, it's a hard task, but you can do it with a, a piece of good quality steel. So, 10 millimetre steel plate was adopted um, to run right through the entire house. So these 10 millimeter steel portal frames, uh, that's actually a plated beam in the middle which is made out of 10 millimeter steel plate. It's not an off the shelf universal beam. Um, and then that just flows through. Everywhere you see some black stuff, it's basically 10 millimeter thick steel. Uh, and the language then for the black and white that my wife wanted to have in there is that anything that's white is basically the shell of the original building. It may have been relined and repainted, but basically that's the form of the original building. Anything that's black, including the furniture, is imported into the building. And the one thing council insisted on was that they have, that we retain the old sign from out the front that said MH Engineering. And it had only been MH Engineering for about seven or eight years. <laughs> <laughs> And when they were told that, they said, OK, OK, but we like the idea of having an old sign out there. So <laughs> they said, if you can give us a sign rather than just putting 41 on it, we'll be happy. So anyway, we gave them a nice three-dimensional <laughs> 10 millimeter thick steel plate address. Now, this is the other side. So this is, you know, you can see, again, thanks, Stephen. Or, that? 
<laughs> that's the floor level in there, and this is a sandstone base. So this was a loading dock, so that's why it was up at that level. You could bring a horse and cart up here and just walk straight onto the back of the, the cart. Um, but council, in their wisdom, said that we had to actually cut this down to floor, uh, down to footpath level, rather than having an external steel stair, which is what I was proposing, because the old loading dock had an external stair, but that's on council land. And even though it had been there since 1895, <laughs> they said I couldn't do it. wasn't allowed to replicate it. Had to <coughs> I had to destroy original fabric, <laughs> which they were hung up about, and, and to do this. It was, it was ridiculous, but anyway. We did that. Um, and you can see that over the years, there's all this incredible sort of brickwork going on. This, this original window that was obviously underneath that one, but then for some unknown reason, the window moved it a little bit sideways. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't then have any hesitation in chopping that bit out. Um, so anyway, and that, that's sort of, there's a couple of white ones there. I think the yellow one's up here somewhere, or maybe it's over here. But anyway, um, that's, that's what we did. Um, and then inside you go into basically another world. Um, a lot of people said, why didn't you leave the brick? Well, inside the brick had been painted over, it had been tiled on, it had been, you know, had all sorts of things done to it. It wasn't particularly nice. Uh, all the old steelwork was rusting and the timber was not in great shape. So we decided we'd simply line it and turn it into a, this other world that we go into. And we have no view as such. Um, so all the glass and all the windows is translucent. So it is literally another world when you go in there. And it's only when you open the window and stick your head out you actually see what's going on in the outside world, which is actually a very nice way to live. You come home after uh, working hard all day and you go into this other environment. And um, you know, if you've got a great view of the harbour or something else, it's great. But when you don't, you're just looking across the street at some other terrace houses, it's much better <laughs> to do it this way. So this whole bookcase following the theme is 10 millimetre thick steel plate. So that's two and a half tonnes of steel there. Um, but rather than really uh, getting the steel fabricator offside, I actually designed them so they were slotted, so that you actually slot the shelves together. And there's only a tiny tack weld at the back to hold it all together, rather than them all being fully welded. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> That's a license. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and the other thing, it, it may not show up quite so well on this screen, maybe on some of the other screens, but um, at the same time that we were working on this house, um, my wife, who's a film production designer, and she works with a director, um, a very famous international director, he was having a book produced on his stills photography in Japan. And uh, it was all black and white photography. And we, were, we had a meeting with one of the Japanese publishers um, at this warehouse. And uh, they, she said, this is very Japanese. And uh, we said, why is that? And she said, because you've used the seven shades of black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it was actually quite interesting to look because, you know, just in that one photograph, you know, there's probably five different shades of black. But it's really interesting that the Japanese really have this thing about the seven shades of black. And I'd never ever thought about it until then. So it's a nice little thing to learn. Um, the other thing about it is, is we tried to keep it as environmentally friendly as possible. And all the materials, you know, they're sort of natural. Um, and this is, the floor is all rubber, uh, black and white rubber. Um, and uh, so the rubber upstairs sits over top of the old timber floor, which has all been sanded back and made nice and smooth, and then we put the rubber over the top. And here's the bathroom, this big piece of furniture that sits within the centre of the space. And what we did was make the, the top of the box set the same datum as the original window openings, and this one obviously we cut, but we cut it up to the same height as the one at the other <coughs> one. And then above that we put the clear glazing and we quite literally just got a can opener and cut a piece of the roof and tilted it up to allow that south light to come in through there. And that clear story window actually lights not only this part of the upstairs living room, but it lights the bedroom. Whereas when this was a warehouse, it was completely pitch black. Because uh, they just had timber doors and that one little Victorian double hung window at the back. And so that's the window that we reinstated. There used to be two big timber doors, but it had been bricked up and had some little ordinary windows in it when we found it. 
and the gallery for my wife's um, black and white um, photographs and the bedroom. So we've kept the upstairs as one space. It's just got that bathroom pod that separates the two. There are no doors. Um, and then inside the bathroom, it's the one place where I sort of twisted the concept a little bit, stretched it a little bit, because this is new and should really be black. <laughs> but, but my wife couldn't go there with a the black bathroom, and so the outside of it's black, the inside's all new. But what we've done here is that the entire bathroom is Corian. Uh, floors, walls, and actually the bathroom downstairs and the laundry both have Corian ceilings as well. Uh, and what I was doing there from a material point of view is trying to look for a completely neutral material that was impervious to water, <coughs> that had no visible joints, that was basically just a colour uh, rather than being identified as a particular material. Uh, and I think this, the whole of this interior is really about the colour and not the material, even though we know what they're made out of, it's, it's really just about the black and white. Um, and again, this, this is a, a long-term thing that's been developed um, over 25 or more years that started with the Hong Kong Bank, because one of the things I worked on on the Hong Kong Bank was the service modules, which had all of the toilets and, and other functions in them, and they were basically built as containers that were prefabricated in Japan, shipped to Hong Kong, and then craned up and slotted into the building. So it's always been this... Uh, uh, thing of mind about prefabrication and so this bathroom system developed when I first started out on my own 25 years ago and it's been refined over and over again and uh, in a lot of them this idea and again it's very Japanese without necessarily thinking about Japan this idea of a wet zone in a dry zone and I actually developed these slot drains which now everyone uses but I developed that for a house in 1995 it was actually a garden drain that separated grass from paving and I said, hey, can we use this inside? And they said, well, no one's ever done that. But anyway, we did, and now everyone uses them, and it's fantastic because it just delineates, you know, dry on this side, wet on that side. And in this case, the bath and the shower are just on the wet side of that line. Now, slightly different, um, no bricks whatsoever in this project. <laughs> I can guarantee you. This is the lower Hunter Valley. I don't know how well you know the Hunter Valley, north of Sydney, wine growing region. Uh, and this is in a little town called Wallumbai. And Wallumbai is a historic town. It's actually um, a great little town. Very windy roads. It's not really on a main road, but it's the scenic route if you go up to the Hunter Valley. And uh, my client bought a remnant olive grove. So all of those trees you see in the foreground are her olive grove. There's a much bigger olive plantation down the road and this guy sold this bit off and she sells the olives back to the guy that she bought the property from. Um, and she wanted a house. There was this shed already there, the water tank, but she wanted to have a house and move up there. So the idea was to come up with some very inexpensive, lightweight house that could be almost prefabricated and taken to the site and put together. And she didn't want the house to be on the flat in the olive grove itself, but wanted it to be on the hillside leading up to the tree line up here. So basically this patch of ground was where I was allowed to put the house and what took my fancy was this big rock. It's the only rock anywhere near there. I don't know where it came from. It must have rolled way down the hill <laughs> years ago and stopped there. So anyway, that, that was critical to me because that was going to be the outlook from the bathroom. So that basically located the house. <laughs> Why the bathroom? <laughs> well, because there's such a great view in every other direction and the bathroom was the only place that I thought, well, it's not really going to be front and centre at that big view, so I'll give it the rock. So, <laughs> um, so yeah get the general view of it. The entry coming in from the street is along this um, southern boundary and then you swing around and come around and park down here in front of the shed and then you go up, up the hill. So just a little side analysis showing that and a little, little rock. Um, but it's a tough site because in the morning you don't get the sun. 
because that's literally the tree line through there and this is a very large hillside so you don't really get the sun until midday when it starts to come clear of this but then in the afternoon you've got this incredible view but you've also got the western sun. Well the thing about it was that the client actually had um, a cousin who lived in Newcastle who had a steel fabrication plant. So she said, he's going to make it. So whatever you design, you've got to make it so he can put it together. <laughs> so the whole house, as you'll see when it comes back on, is made up of very short pieces of steel that could fit on the truck and could drive around all the windy roads and eventually get to this isolated site and be put together without having to use a crane. Possibly a small mobile crane, but basically most pieces were going to be lifted into place by hand. And it was also about having the most minimal footprint on the site. We didn't really want to have any major excavation. There was a little bit, but not a lot. And we also didn't want to have a lot of concrete. We wanted to basically make it so that some local builder could put it together with you know, maybe one concrete truck and that's it. Um, and then everything else was just basically a kit set. So it's a whole prefabricated idea. But the, the critical part of uh, my thinking was the fact that it was on the slope. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if you're going to put a house on a slope, if you look at even some of my heroes like Craig Elwood, if you look at some of Craig Elwood's houses that are on hillsides, if you look underneath them, there's a ridiculous amount of sticks holding them up. And you know, obviously pole houses are a classic example, you know, you're up there but you've got all these tree trunks below you. That was the last thing I wanted, I, and particularly because you approached from below and you actually looked up the hillside at the house. So the first thing that you saw, instead of being the undercroft with the plumbing hanging down and all <laughs> these sticks holding it up, I thought that's exactly the last thing that I want anyone to see. And what I really wanted to see was this sort of, you know, a fifth or sixth elevation, if you count the roof as the fifth elevation. So it was really important um, that I see something good and then started thinking about the angle of the slope and when you look at the angle of the slope and then I'm thinking well we need to have a roof and we're going to collect the water from the roof and it's got to have a slope and then the slope of the hillside and the slope of the roof and so there are all these angles coming together and I thought well we've got a cantilever this thing off the hillside and obviously if we prop the cantilever we've got a bit of an angle and if we basically end up with all the same angles, we end up with this sort of unusual shape. Almost bedroom. Almost bedroom. Bedroom, yeah. <laughs> so you'll see in a moment when you see my first little sketch. So really? this one, this is the most important one. So um, <coughs> we also had no money. Thank you very much, whoever did that. Great work. <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea that you have the most minimal footprint and you also have the tightest little floor plan. So it's a 12 metre uh, by 12 metre square plan divided up very simply. So you have living, dining, kitchen, you have an outdoor room, main bedroom, second bedroom, bathroom, looking at the rock. Uh, <laughs> the slope, the roof, you know, the underside, looking up at basically something that looks not dissimilar to the roof. And so that the concept was that it's basically an inverted roof uh, that's just somehow, the, the pointy bits got stuck into the hillside. Um, and then you just put this very simple economical box between these two roofs. And just to make it more interesting architecturally, you don't put the apex in the centre. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all do it, we all do it. So uh, you dig a little hole, put a little bit of concrete in it, and this is great because you put the water tank, you put the EnviroCycle sewage treatment bit, and you put the plumbing and everything else in there. And what was really great was it was going to have that Close Encounters of the Third Kind door, which just comes up, and you walk in and it closes and you don't know it's there. So it, no one can rob you because they don't know how to get in. Um, so then you, you put these little short pieces of steel and, and the floor and then some more short pieces of steel and then a few more short pieces of steel and there it is, it's all made, it's all triangulated so structurally it's all taken care of, no bracing required, uh, very very straightforward and there's really just this one 
column which actually starts at the bottom that goes all the way to the top to that apex point. So there is some common sense to it. Um, and then hollowing that out to create the outdoor room so it's part of that overall volume. So even with the very compact plan you're still making even more use of it by making the outdoor room part of it. Uh, and this is all clad in black aluminium. Uh, so these are the, the real drawings. Uh, so you can see they're uh, pretty straightforward. The front door is actually here, so you come up some steps further along, you come along this path following the contour and then pop in the door there. And then as soon as you come in, you've got the big view up the valley. Roof. And then what was actually nice about it is in section, you start to understand the volume of the space and because of the asymmetrical nature of the roof itself you get these different volumes within each space you go into. And then as you actually drive up at the bottom that's you know that idea of looking up at the underside which is to me what's you know the most important thing in this whole concept was seeing that rather than seeing sticks and pipes. And then the, the other nice thing is you actually see up into it and you understand the full three-dimensional volume internally as well. And then from a low-flying helicopter you see that view. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is probably my favourite because you really understand how it's cantilevered off the hillside and how it takes in the view and when you're actually in that space you're not on the hillside, you're actually out somewhere else, beyond the line of the hill. <coughs> and then the bathroom window, which <laughs> looks at the rock. Which is good. So that's, that's the top of the bath just there, has this big angled sill so you can sit in the bath and just look at the rock. Um, okay, another one. This does have brick. Um, you probably won't think so when you've seen the pictures, but uh, it's an interesting one because this is, you know, you probably have problems with council over here, but probably a lot less than we do. This is in Castle Cove, which is on Middle Harbour on Sydney's sort of middle North Shore. And there was a 1970s house here, and when we did this house, they said we couldn't have it the same size, we couldn't have it in the same place, we couldn't have it as high because all the rules had changed since they built it. They said, but if we kept 30% of the original house, we could. <laughs> so that's the 30%, which is that brick wall. <laughs> Everything else got demolished. <laughs> uh, and we built this completely new steel framed double height wing down here. And it's, it's a very interesting site because it's on the ridge it doesn't have a view of Middle Harbour, that sort of Middle Harbour is down this way. Um, and what they're looking at is basically a district view and Chatswood, if anyone knows Sydney well, knows Chatswood up there. And if you look down that way, you see North Sydney way in the distance. But you look over the top of all the other houses around there. It's quite a, an amazing site. Um, but the nice thing about the plan is that We've sort of got these his and hers garages in the central entry <laughs> and uh, this corridor that goes through and you look straight out to the view. And if you, if you know a lot of my early houses, uh, and it's still, to today we're still doing the same thing, that we don't like rooms with doors. What we like is spaces with sliding walls. And so this is all about sliding walls. So that you can sort of just make it out, but these are a whole series of sliding wall panels, so that you can actually open all of these spaces up to the corridor, and so spatially it feels much more generous when it's opened up. And then there's more sliding panels here to close off this TV room, and then everything else is just completely open. Uh, it's a quick elevation, so you sort of understand the topography. Uh, there's also a couple of little clear story, north-west facing clear stories to actually bring light and ventilation into particularly that southern range of bedrooms. Um, there's also lots of these natural rock outcrops, so it's built on a big lump of rock. And uh, we wanted to actually um, highlight that by leaving them all there. Um, 
and uh, people think we've actually placed them there. We've got the landscaper in and put these rocks there. It's quite bizarre. Uh, anyway, uh, and this is this is a project that I finished officially in 2003. Were you still in the office in 2003? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's been ongoing. I'm still working on it. He still hasn't done the swimming pool. He promises me that this winter he's going to do the swimming pool. But I should tell you before I show you the pictures that this guy is a lovely, lovely man. He's slightly eccentric. He loves two things. He loves me and he loves Philippe Stark. Now, <laughs> they, don't, they don't go together. <laughs> so when he came to me to do this house, he had already bought a whole lot of stuff that Philippe Stark had designed. So he had a whole lot of furniture, he had door handles, he had light fittings, he had a bath, he had taps, he even had a toilet. And he said, they're all in storage waiting for the house to be built. So we had to integrate them. So if you see anything that looks probably not quite like my usual stuff, that's, that's Philippe Stark. <laughs> <laughs> but I've made the most of it, you know, I've tried hard. Um, you sure will be able to tell? <laughs> uh, so you see this great long corridor on the stair that drops off at the end. Um, so there it is, from the front door, and you can see the sliding walls, and through to the view in the distance. And the bathroom, which you know is is very much that idea that the bathroom is just part of the space. It's not this private room. It's completely closed off, but. As long as none of you tell anyone else, but my client has never used this bathroom. <laughs> he thinks it's so special that he has to send everyone downstairs or into the ensuite. <laughs> and one of his wife's friends came to stay and was in this shower, and he came home from work and he heard the shower and he ran down there and said, What are you doing? <laughs> Slightly crazy. Anyway, there's, there's a piece of Philippe's uh, um, uh, it looks sort of okay there, as a piece of sculpture, not as a bar stool. Um, and the great thing about this is this space, because this space is, it's a bit like that last one, hanging off the hillside. This is also hanging off the hillside, and when you're in this space, you're above everything else, and you've just got this extraordinary view. And uh, the idea that we have this steel frame which is set inboard of the glass lines, all the doors as in most of my projects all slide away and so you're left in this completely open uh, planned space where the balcony becomes part of the living space and you get these incredible views and that's Chatswood out there uh, and it's actually, it's a bizarre view because it's not a view that you could sort of really tell someone, oh, I've got this incredible view, I look over all these houses, <laughs> you know, but when you get there and you look at it, it's actually pretty amazing. Um, but what you do realise, for someone who lives in the middle of the city, when you get up there and you see how far away Chatswood is and you realise you're a long way from the centre of the world <laughs> <laughs> and that's just a suburb of Sydney. Um, and the ensuite. So all the bathrooms actually got views as well, so they all open up. Uh, and then this was supposed to be the TV room, but again, this is a room that he doesn't actually let anyone sit in. Um, <laughs> put the TV out in the main space, uh, and that's a Philippe Stark sofa. <laughs> Probably the most straightforward piece of furniture that he's ever designed, and of course there's two little horn lights up here. Uh, now this one is definitely a brick building, but this one won't ever see the light of day. This is um, a little story about, again, our friends at Council. This is North Sydney Council. This is in Neutral Bay and has an amazing view to the south, out in that direction of the centre of Sydney and the Harbour Bridge is just over there. Uh, this is an existing rock face with a, a wall built in front of it so that the actual ground level at the moment is three metres above the footpath and then it slopes up and there's a secondary street up here and this used to be a house, there's, there's a big old house here and they subdivided it in the 60s through the middle and sold off this front portion and they built a little modest 60s house there. So my client bought the 60s house and asked us to design three apartments there, which we did. We went to council and they said we don't want to approve this 
We said, why not complies? There's no reason you, you can't. And they said, I oh, know we're very concerned about you leaving this house up here, which will become an isolated site that can't be developed. So we actually want you to buy the house as well <laughs> and develop it as one unified site. So my client did that, made the guy an offer he couldn't refuse to buy his house. And the old house had been renovated, I don't know how many times, but there was virtually nothing of the original house left. Uh, and you could see any architect would walk down that street and they could pick the 1970s edition, the 1980s and the 1990s edition. It was that clear. Um, never ever was it on the uh, Heritage Register of North Sydney Council. In all the years that they've had a Heritage Register, it never made the cut. Never ever. Until we designed this. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's the parking you drive in from the lower street straight into the car park. And then we designed a building which was about maximising the view to the south, but still trying to allow the apartments to get what little northern light we were able to do. And we were just lucky that it was a triangular site, so we were able to sort of step the building to bring northern light in to each of those steps. And as you go further up, we developed this quite nice sort of communal space on the northwestern <coughs> edge, uh, which was just below the street. So you have a barbecue, communal barbecue, and these built-in tables, and then the front door to the building. And then as we go up above that, we get two bedroom units to pop in at the front, which do face north and look over a tennis club. And then we had a whole series of sight lines that we had to maintain, so we were sort of stepping the building in to allow this building to still have its sight line of the Harbour Bridge past the building that's over on this side here. And this is where it gets really interesting because this is a, a site surrounded by 1960s and 1970s apartment buildings, the majority of which are brick. <coughs> and you can see over here we've got this guy that's seven storeys, there's one next to it that's nine storeys. This guy's five, this one's five and a half, getting on for six. And so we put five storeys, but it's stepped, there's basically, you know, three levels here, and then these two are set back. And there's our stone wall across the front. Mm -hmm. And then along the west, uh, the, those other buildings are right beside us, so we've got these glass reinforced concrete privacy screens and western sunscreens along that side. And there's a public walkway that goes between our site and the, the neighbouring site. So it's all brick. So. The building on the far side is a grey engineering brick from 1971. The one immediately adjacent to us on this side is a really awful red brick from the 50s. And then the other two bigger ones are sort of a, a brownie brick from the 70s. Um, and we were determined not to have any of those but to go somewhere else as you'll see. Um, but all brick as you can see on those elevations. And then from the street this is where it becomes absurd. You see this very modest, it's basically three stories and a little bit. Four stories there. This guy here is almost the same. And then you step up to these guys here. Anyway, council said it's an overdevelopment of the site. <laughs> so they said it's way too tall and it's totally inappropriate in its context. Uh, so, and that's the eastern side, and look what's behind it, so it's totally inappropriate. So we went to the Land and Environment Court, and the second day we were in the court, they suddenly said that they were going to approve the three-storey building that I'd previously designed down here, that they wouldn't approve before. So they approved that and sent through the approval while we were in the court, and said that then they put a heritage order on this house. <laughs> So now we're just we're just finished documentation of the little houses, all right? Oops, gone crazy. Uh, so we've just finished the documentation of the little three apartment building, but this one will never see the light of day. So 
Anyway, that was going to be my first brick apartment building. <laughs> so unfortunately, I won't be able to come back and show you that in a year or so's time. It's not happening. But you can see, uh, again, the sort of the colour of that one, the one that we didn't like so much, and then there was the, the grey one next door. And we were going for something a little bit more David Chipperfield in between. Um, and then my last project, and I'm probably way over time, sorry Penny. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a site in Summer Hill. Uh, again, I don't know whether any of you know Summer Hill. It's in the inner west of Sydney, so it's not far from Leichhardt. Uh, it's a very, very typical inner west suburban uh, area which has a whole series of federation houses with huge backyards. So basically the original house is, is that federation one there, and these are all federation houses all the way around it, and it had a football field out the back with just grass, was originally a tree there um, that got cut down. And what I wanted to do was put a white aluminium stealth bomber in the backyard, which I thought was a fairly reasonable proposition. Uh, but again, my friends at council, and particularly their heritage consultant, said that it was absolutely never going to get approved. He said, you need to use brick. <laughs> and then he said, and a corrugated iron roof. And I said, forget it, it's never going to happen. And he said, OK, I'll make a compromise. You've got to use brick, but you're allowed to use a zinc roof. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, I've made this incredibly good argument because, as you can see, there's a gable there. There's a gable across the front, and then there's these hips. So I said, look, it's, there's a gable, and there's this elongated hip. It's exactly the same thing. <laughs> And, uh, but he didn't fall for it. Um, <laughs> and the reason I wanted it to be a white stealth bomber was actually the desire to build a tent. That's what I really wanted to do, was build a tent. Because it has north out there, and it has this football field around it. And if you stand there, you can actually see Centrepoint Tower and the, the taller towers in the city of Sydney which my clients thought was great. I just thought, again, like the last project, it just reminded me how far away I was from where I live. <laughs> but to them, that was great, because it reminded them that they still lived in Sydney. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, I digress. Um, so what I wanted to do was build a tent, which basically had a big roof and had one tent pole that held it up. And so that's what we did. And so this is the typical Federation house, faithfully restored. Landscaping needs a bit of work, but um, <laughs> that's where we started. It's lots of white. You know, this is pebble dash uh, render. Uh, there's even white um, joints in the brickwork. You know, the white aluminium box was so compatible with this. It's just ridiculous. Anyway, so that's what we built. And we actually used glazed brick. I thought it would be really clever. And I thought, if they're going to insist on brick, I'm going to use white glazed brick, which I did for the first time. And I've got to let you know a little secret. And it's probably a terrible place to tell people, <laughs> being in a brickwork showroom. But the glazed brick was a nightmare, because when the builder ordered them all, the wastage was around about 20%, because they come out of the pallet and they're chipped, and you can't use them unless you get a paintbrush and paint that bit white. So it's probably the first and last time I used glazed brick. But anyway, I should have just painted it white. Um, anyway, so that's what it looks like when it's closed up, which is not what it's really about. This is what it's about. It's about being in this tent with this one tent pole and having these steps that just cascade down into this backyard. And um, it's about how we all live in Perth, in Sydney, even in Melbourne. You know, you actually want to live in a space like this where it completely opens up and you're open to the north and to the backyard and, and these people have now got a small child and so they wanted to let them run around the backyard. And, uh, you know, being able to have lunch outside but actually not having two dining tables. You know, you just have the inside one and you open the doors and you're eating outdoors. You know, it's really good. Um, and then the roof again, and this is again that, that house up in the Hunter Valley with the, the roof, it, it really was done roughly the same time as this. So the idea of starting to explore 
a traditional pitched roof but actually hollowing them out and actually really using that volume that's created and particularly when we're stepping down half a level so we're actually using that volume to make the transition from one space to another and actually decreasing the height but we still end up with three and a half metre high sliding doors and then even in the bathroom here we thought I'd take the brick theme through so we've got you know the the brick bond white bricks to match the glazed bricks on the outside so I think that's the end so that's my little journey to, to a brick future thank you <laughs>